Last week, I had the opportunity to visit an artificial pancreas clinical trial taking place at Massachusetts General Hospital. The volunteer, Jim Stage, was gearing up to spend two full days hooked up to a machine that would have complete control over his insulin, as well as the additional hormone glucagon, which is used to raise low blood sugar. Although spending two days inside a hospital room might not seem like your typical vacation, Jim was very enthusiastic about participating in this clinical trial. And I have to admit, I was kind of jealous. Well, I just think it's so exciting to be able to think about sitting down to eat a meal um, and not having any worries. Dr. Stephen Russell gave me a quick tour on how the artificial pancreas trial is set up. Our navigator transmitters. So there's actually two of them. This one is the one that's actively transmitting uh, interstitial fluid glucose signal to the uh, receiver and it's in this cradle which uh, takes the blood glucose information being received by the navigator and transmits it to the laptop through a USB cable. The computer takes that information and makes decisions about dosing of insulin and glucagon. These special uh, PDMs, these special dex or, um, insulet PDMs that are controlled via USB cable from the computer. And there's one for glucagon and there's one for insulin. So they, once they have the information about what they're supposed to do from the computer, they then transmit that information to these pods. We have a glucagon pod and an insulin pod. The glucagon for me was really what made it seem feasible. Right. Because it's really hard prospectively to dose insulin perfectly. Sensing, determining what to do with the information, controlling the pumps, and then the loop repeats every five minutes. Since CGMs and insulins aren't quite perfect, patients still receive a small premium bolus. The computer is also deciding how much basal to give a person. It'll be an amount such that if you underestimate the carbs significantly, you still won't overdose yourself. Right. And if you, uh, if you underestimate the carbs, and you ate more than you thought you did, the algorithm can still pick up the slack. Now these might look like your garden variety navigator CGM and Omnipod insulin pumps, but they have been specially designed to work with the artificial pancreas trials. So that's something they put together for artificial pancreas research, and they provided that to any group who wanted to use them to do artificial pancreas research. And likewise, Insulet made these special PDMs. They're red, I don't know if you noticed that, they're not blue, but they're red PDMs. It's just a slave to the computer rather than getting the information from somebody typing bolus into the front. Although Navigator has been proven to be the most accurate CGM, Abbott isn't investing in their Navigators anymore. This means Dexcom or Minimed will have to significantly improve their CGM's accuracy and lag time so that clinical trials can move forward with technology that's actually in production. So we don't like to be locked into any particular uh, sensor technology. Um, unless the company makes it clear that they're really going to make a, a commitment to make it available. You know, we could be in the position of having that not available. Right. And so we have to have backups. Um, so that's why we, we continue to test uh, any new sensor technology that comes along we're interested in. If you think that wearing a couple extra sensors is all it takes, you obviously haven't heard how stringent the FDA is when it comes to safety. The team had Jim hooked up to an old school device called the Gluco Scout, which measures the blood sugar and compares it with what the CGM says. In addition, the nurses regularly ran a separate lab test to double check the Gluco Scout. The CGM may not be perfectly accurate. Um, and in fact, we know it isn't, for instance, at the high blood glucose ranges and there's less. The CGM is running uh, 30 uh, milligrams per deciliter high. Um, the, the algorithm will be responding to that by giving insulin and could potentially be driving someone low. And the most important part <laughs> is the volunteer <laughs> Yay. who is willing to come in and spend two days with us um, hooked up to the system and eat six meals and do some exercise and see how the uh, algorithm performs controlling the blood sugar. Obviously it's a little uncomfortable but I don't, you know, it's just part of the process. So basically the final system would be a sensor a pod for insulin, a pod for glucagon, and a PDM that would receive the signal, would have the computer algorithm on it, would take the place of the laptop, and would control both of the, the pods. At the end of the weekend, Jim sent a note with cautious praise of the artificial pancreas. 
Although he said that when it worked well, it was awesome, he noted that periods of borderline hypoglycemia meant receiving dozens of mini doses of glucagon. Some of the side effects of glucagon for Jim were severe headaches and nausea. He also found the lag time of the CGM caused delays in receiving insulin doses when he needed it. There are some obvious challenges in creating an artificial pancreas, and we're certainly not going to take a guess at when anyone might see a fully functioning one, but I'm personally crossing my fingers that we'll see one soon. Oh, it's a very challenging disease, but I, you know, I think this is really positive hope for type 1 diabetics, particularly young people and teenagers, to say, hang in there, something much better is on the way, and it's going to be here relatively soon.